Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show. You know what I get to do? I get to find rock stars in dentistry and have them share great information with you to help you create a better practice and a better life. And today, I've got a brand new one to our podcast. Her name is Brittany Sierra Murphy, and she's a myofunctional therapist, and she's awesome. Today, she shares her insight on correct oral rest posture and nasal breathing. Please listen to this. I know you guys will enjoy it, and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. I'm so excited you're here because one of the cool things I get to do is I get to meet really cool people in dentistry who introduce me to other really cool people in dentistry. And you're going to love today's episode because a good friend of mine, Dr. Steve Carsonson, said you got to meet somebody else. And she's a brilliant myofunctional therapist. And today we're going to be talking about pick your jaw up off the floor, the correct, the importance of correct oral rest posture and nasal breathing with Brittany Sierra Murphy. Brittany, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, I want to start here because this is an important subject um, and I want people to know who they're listening to. So you're new to the podcast. I've never had a myofunctional therapist on. This is the first time. So I'm so excited. Tell us a little bit about your story and your bio. I want to know, I want people to know who they're listening to. Yeah, absolutely. So my background's actually in dental hygiene. I became a registered dental hygienist in 2011, graduated from the Forsyth School of Dental Hygiene. I actually wanted to be a dental hygienist since I was seven, which is really weird. I know, but I wanted to be, and I loved every part of being a hygienist. That is actually what led me down the road of myofunctional therapy. I read about it in an RDH magazine in 2000, I think it was 2015. And I was like, what is myofunctional therapy? I have no idea what this is. Never heard the term. Didn't remember learning it in school. Um, and I just was really curious because the article that I read that was written by Joy Moeller, who's one of the legends of myofunctional therapy, just talked about how important it is for our patients and how much more of an impact we can make on their overall health. So I'm in. Let me dive in. Researched it. Found a course, uh, took a course at NYU in 2016, actually from Joy Moeller, who wrote the article, and have taken a bajillion courses after that. I actually teach a course now to other registered dental hygienists to become myofunctional therapists. And for anybody listening that doesn't know what myofunctional therapy is, that's okay. You're going to know all about it by the end of this episode. It is not a new therapy. A lot of people think that it's something that just came out in the last like decade or you know one to two decades. It's been in the literature for over a century. So think back to uh, Dr. Engel, how we classify our occlusion. He actually discussed the same things that we talk about in myofunctional therapy. It wasn't called myofunctional therapy. But he talked about the importance of the oral facial muscle function and how that dysfunction or the lips being apart or mouth breathing or the tongue not being where it should be can really interfere with orthodontic stability. So much so that they titled these oral facial muscles living orthodontic appliances. That was actually Dr. Alfred Rogers in like 1918, I think. Um, so it's been in the literature not called myofunctional ther therapy then. You might also hear it as other terms. Some people call it oral facial myology, oral facial myofunctional therapy. It's it's all the same. Um, what is myofunctional therapy is probably, you know, your next question. The, the technical term for it is the neuromuscular re-education of the oral and facial muscles. It's essentially like having a personal trainer for the muscles of the oral facial complex. Um, you know, we have common goals that we work on with our patients. Essentially, it's to restore proper oral rest posture, which again, you might not know what that is. So think about right now, as you're listening to me, I want you to just breathe. And I want you to think about where you feel your tongue inside your mouth. 
weird question. Like all my patients, when they come in, they're like, well, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me that before. My tongue is like moving everywhere now that you brought so much attention to my tongue. But if you're having correct tongue posture, if you think about where you say the letter N, where the tip of your tongue hits up behind your upper front teeth, essentially right on your incisive papilla, that is where the tip of your tongue should rest. And that whole tongue should actually be resting up in the roof of the mouth. The lips should be closed and we should be breathing through our nose. This is really what our goals uh, goal is as a myofunctional therapist is to restore this posture. No one's ever taught me that ever. Yeah. Like I, we've had this conversation. <laughs> so this is so cool. Now I want to introduce a couple things um, because we're going to go down this path. If you're listening to this podcast and you have a self-limiting belief that, oh, I get it, but my town, I can't find a myofunctional therapist. I want to help you guys understand couple things. Number one, Brittany has a podcast titled I Spy With My Myo Eye. So she also has a Facebook page, a YouTube. She's got a course. We're going to talk about all that, but don't tell yourself, oh, I can't make this happen. And you also mentioned you can do this virtually. So let's say I'm, let's say I'm in a remote area as a dentist and like the closest town is 30. Could you help me? Absolutely. We see patients globally, actually. And I very early on in my practice started virtually because there weren't a lot of providers near me that understood the importance of myofunctional therapy. So we've seen patients internationally all over the United States. It can totally be done. We, of course, need to have a good internet connection and like a nice bright lit room, but we can totally do myofunctional therapy virtually. And, and that's a really cool part because we're able to reach so many more people that way. Never even thought of that either. So mm -hmm. this is so cool. Um, let's start with the big why. And I know this is a big, important time, but if I was even considered, why is this topic so important in dentistry right now? Yeah. And I think whoever you are listening, whether you're a pediatric dentist, general dentist, orthodontist, cosmetic dentist, sleep dentist, there's a place for myofunctional therapy in literally every single dental treatment plan. Um, you know, orthodontic wise, that's, that's a big one. We do work a lot with orthodontists. And one of the things that I like to explain, whether it's, you know, other professionals that I'm, you know, lecturing to about myofunctional therapy or patients, when they come in, it's really important to understand that structure and function go hand in hand, and you can't really have one without the other, right? You can slap braces on somebody. You can get those teeth to move while they're actually physically in the braces. But what about when you take those braces off? What's going to happen if that soft tissue dysfunction was not corrected? We see a lot of patients with orthodontic relapse. So patients, you know, that have tongue thrust, um, that can even impact cosmetic dentistry. I mean, how good is doing cosmetic dentistry on somebody that's always thrusting their tongue? What, what good is that cosmetic dentistry if we can't keep those teeth inside our mouth? Um, periodontal disease, there's a link uh, between that. Think about the forces of uh, clenching and grinding, bruxism, what that does to the periodontium, mouth breathing, what we already know what that does to the health of our gums. So there's a place, like I said, for myofunctional therapy everywhere. I think one of the most important things is we want to understand truly the importance of nasal breathing and that it's not okay to breathe through our mouth. Yes, maybe when you're doing some high intensity workouts, that's fine. However, otherwise, those lips should always, always, always be closed um, during the day and at night. You know, you hear patients come in and, you know, they're talking about maybe their children and they might snore. They might snore a little bit or my husband's snoring. I have to sleep in the other room. Like snoring is not OK, no matter who you are, what age you are. We should be sleeping in our rooms nice and quiet. I always tell my pa uh, parents, you want to go in your child's room put your finger underneath their nose to make sure that they're breathing. That's how quiet we want our children to be when they're sleeping. Yeah. And this is a big challenge. I mean, this is one of those things that scares you. We don't know enough about it. Um, and as we learn more, you know, I remember I'll do a quick shout out to Dr. Jeff Rouse, probably about, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, he gave me a piece of tape at a Seattle uh -huh. study club symposium. He's like, I want you to sleep this with this over your mouth. And I showed my wife, and she's like, you, you're you going to die if you put that over your mouth. Because, <laughs> And sure enough, I put it, I'm like, that was amazing. And now even this past weekend, I'm having beers with another dad and he's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I've been snoring and I've been taping my lips. I'm like, and he knows nothing about dentistry. Yep, yep. So, 
So it's coming to a place where it's more commonplace that we have to breathe through our, our nose. And it's still, it's a big problem, even for the younger patients Mm -hmm. um, and decoding this, right? Yeah. I mean, we work a lot with uh, ENTs and, you know, we want to make sure that patients can breathe through their nose. You could be the best myofunctional therapist in like America or to ever exist. But if your patient cannot breathe through their nose, it is very hard for us to be successful. So we have to see, you know, what is that root cause of mouth breathing? Um, You know, are there enlarged tonsils, enlarged adenoids, turbinates? Do they have a tongue tie that's impacting their ability to get their tongue up in the roof of their mouth? You know, there's so many things that we want to look at. And, you know, it's funny, my my husband actually lip tapes now. And at first he was like, really, like, you're going to make me do this. I'm like, well, I want to know what uh, lip tape actually sticks to beards. My husband has a big beard. I'm like, so I want to know for my pa- my manly patients who have these monstrous beards. It's like, I want to still be able to recommend a good brand. And he was somebody that would wake up every single night at least once or twice to use the bathroom. And when he sleeps with his lip tape on, he does not wake up at all. His quality of sleep is so much more um, improved because again, he's breathing through his nose. Now, lip tape, uh, you know, I just want to make a little disclaimer. It's not for everybody. Again, if you have um, any difficulty breathing through your nose, you don't, of course, want to get rid of that only route that you have to survive. In that case, usually what I do just to be safe is I would recommend like a kinesiology tape and you would actually tape around the lips. That way those lips are open. If you have to breathe through your mouth, you can. Anybody that's used kinesiology tape before, it's like a little bit, you know, uh, stretchy. So as you put it on, it kind of pulls, you know, pulls the skin a little bit closer together, helps to keep your lips closed, serves as a reminder to your brain, like, okay, there's something on my face that isn't normally here. Oh yeah, we need to try to keep our lips closed. Um, So I'm a big fan of kinesiology tape, but you know, nasal breathing, the importance of sleep. I mean, we could do a whole podcast on that, Um, you know, not only for our growing children, but even for us as adults. And I think it's important that we really continue to stress that importance because there's so many kids out there that are truly suffering and that are getting, you know, mislabeled ADHD, getting mislabeled with behavioral issues. Like kids respond differently to not getting enough sleep than we do as adults. As adults, we're lethargic. We want to sit there and we want to watch Netflix. Kids become hyperactive. They're trying to do everything they can to possibly keep themselves awake. And There's a big correlation. I want to say it's like 75% of patients, children that are diagnosed with ADHD actually have an underlying sleep disordered breathing um, issue going on. And that's the other thing. I feel like in dentistry, there's not enough practices that are focusing on sleep, even though we should, because every dentist should be screening for sleep disordered breathing. But we think about sleep apnea. And like, that's really all anybody thinks about, but like sleep apnea is like that final destination. We don't want to get to sleep disordered. Breathing is really an umbrella term, mouth breathing, snoring, upper airway resistance. Then we get to full blown sleep apnea. So again, it's not normal to have any kind of snoring, no matter how old you are. Yeah. I want to go back to the 75%. That's frightening. It actually struck a chord with me because we know how important this is, but I think we have an epidemic in this country of seven and eight year old kids who in that age, they can't focus during the day. And what happens is, and it happens in our community, the mm-hmm. parent gets an email from the teacher saying that kid can't focus. Right. The parent takes the kid to the doctor and the doctor's quick to write a script for speed. Mm-hmm. And it's a prescription that the kid will never get off of ever because the body learns to be dependent on it when nobody asks some questions like, is the kid sleep? So like, this is an incredible opportunity to help these kids. 75%. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And again, simple questions that can be asked about sleep and sleep patterns and behavior. And, you know, we have um, my partner and I, so like I said, I teach a course uh, to other dental hygienists to become myofunctional therapies. I co-teach with my partner, Carice Laguerre, and we came up with a uh, screening that you can do in the app. It's the acronym is BROOMS. Um, And we can talk about, about that because I think we can make it available to any of the listeners. I can email it to you. Um, it's very quick to do in your intraoral, extraoral exam as a registered dental hygienist. You're not taking all this crazy time aside to do this. So 
brooms, the B in broom stands for bruxism. So any signs of wear going on, any signs of clenching and grinding going on, maybe your patient has massive tori in their mouth. Well, those grew from somewhere. Um, the R stands for respiration. How are they breathing? Are they breathing through their mouth? When you're looking at your patients, even before you get your patient, uh, I'm sorry, call your patient from the waiting room, like observe them in their natural habitat. How are they sitting? Are they super slumped over? Is their mouth slumped open? When you watch them breathe, are you seeing a lot of chest movement? Or are you seeing the movement come from your diaphragm? Because that's really that primary muscle that we want to be breathing from. Um, okay, so that was the R. The first O is, I think it's open mouth. There's two O's. I think the first one's open mouth posture, technically. So again, monitoring them. Is it typical that they have those lips apart? Or are they together? And very simple, you can obviously see their teeth if their lips are apart. So when parents are like, oh, I don't know if their lips are, you know, together or open. Well, do you see their teeth? That's a that's a big uh, tail sign. Patients that have to use um, chapstick, they might whip out the chapstick while they're in your chair. There, there is a reason why your lips are chronically chapped. I mean, aside from the fact that, yes, chapstick smell fabulous and we always, you know, people, lipsticks and glosses and things like that. If your lips are chronically chapped, that's a sure sign that you're probably doing some mouth breathing and have your mouth slumped open. The M stands for maxillary transverse width. So this is something that should be taken, I think, on every single patient, and that can be easily done. Take a cotton roll. A cotton roll measures about 37 millimeters. Make sure, I don't know if it differs, you know, company to company, but generally it's about 37 millimeters. Stick that cotton roll up between 3 and 14 or the baby second molars and see if it fits. I mean, if we're talking about an adult and you're squishing that cotton roll up between three and 14, they are deficient. There's probably some crowding going on, or they probably have that high, narrow palate. Um, for our children, depending on the age, of course, 37 millimeters might be a little bit too big, but by age five, we want to have a 30 millimeter transverse width. And there's not, unfortunately, a lot of five-year-olds walking out there with 30 millimeters. Think about your pediatric patients. I mean, we would love to see so much spacing between those primary teeth that you can take a nickel and slide it up there. We don't see that a lot, you know, and a lot of parents think, oh, their teeth are close together. This is great. They're not going to need braces. But we know that that's not true. What's going to happen when, you know, those exfoliate and those adult teeth come in? So very simple, a simple thing you can do. Um, let's see, that was the M. And then the last S is strained mentalis. So when you're looking at a patient <clears throat> and they, you ask them to close their lips, you might see some strain going on in this chin area and that mentalis having some activation, even sometimes without them actually closing their lips, you end up seeing some strain here. And that can be a sign of um, vertical overgrowth. So maybe that jaw is really growing down versus forward like we want. A lot of those patients will have longer faces, gummier smiles. It's a lot more difficult for them to actually get that true lip competence. Um, and that, how simple is that? That's something that can be done in a Jiffy as an RDH. And that's a good screener for if this patient needs a myofunctional referral. Yeah, I love this acronym. So I'm I, I'm I'm taking notes here. So yeah, no worries. The second O. So the first O was open mouth posture. What was oh, the and we didn't o? do the second O. The second O. <laughs> the second O is orally defensive. That's a big one because we see this a lot um, in the dental world. So think about for my hygienists that are listening. You know, you're trying to scale those lower anteriors, and that lower lip is hooked so far over. You're almost like standing up to like fulcrum to be able to scale down there. There's a reason. Those patients that are severe gag reflex, you're dreading when you unfortunately see their name in the schedule and they're due for a full set of x-rays. There's a reason for that. They're trying to protect their airway. That tongue that constantly follows you around, everywhere your mirror goes, that tongue follows. Difficulty retracting the cheek. Any kind of oral defensive sign, there's probably some kind of dysfunction going on there. Yeah. So a big part of this is actually training patients how to think correctly. So we talked about tongue posture. That is, I, I'm, I'm so curious. We could turn this into a two hour episode. No yeah. question. 
<laughs> so we talked about nasal breathing at night. Give us like, how do you teach people to breathe during the day through, through nasal breathing? Mm -hmm. So a lot of us myofunctional therapists also do breathing reeducation. So the type of br uh, breathing reeducation that I'm trained in is called buteco breathing. Um, a lot of it is first getting, okay, let me backtrack. I'm going to give you guys a challenge. I would like for you to try to suction your tongue up to the roof of your mouth like this. And then I want you to try to breathe through your mouth. Tell me, can you breathe through your mouth if your tongue is up like that? You no. physically can't, right? No, you so can't. So it's when that tongue posture drops that we become mouth breathers. That tongue has to be sitting up in the roof of the mouth in order for us to be good nasal breathers. And what's important is, you know, we talked about tongue posture, but sometimes what people don't understand is we need that whole tongue up there. You'll hear myofunctional therapists talk about the spot a lot. And we say, bring your tongue to the spot. And the spot is essentially that incisive papilla. But if you just have the tip of your tongue up there and the rest of your tongue is hanging down, and then you're going to go to sleep and you're laying in a supine position and that tongue's not up and gravity takes over because, again, you're laying down, that tongue is going to fall into the airway and block your airway. So we have to ensure that we're able to get that tongue up there. Now, we do that through myofunctional therapy, through that neuromuscular reeducation, but we also have to remember sometimes there's limitations. And those limitations, one of them can be a tethered oral tissue, so a tongue tie. And this is a topic that needs to be discussed more in dentistry because in school, we don't get enough training. I think us as hygienists and you guys as dentists, we get very, very limited. I mean, we see the picture of like true ankle glossio where the tip of the tongue is completely tethered. That frenum is attached right to the tip of the tongue. Those patients typically can't stick their tongue out past their lower lip. There's other types of tongue ties. It could be a more posterior tongue tie where this patient might still be able to stick their tongue down to their chin curl their tongue up to the nose, but it's impacting more the function of that posterior part of the tongue. And it's that posterior part of the tongue that has to be elevated for good nasal breathing, that has to elevate to have a good swallowing pattern. So we can't just ask a patient to protrude their tongue because that is literally one function of the tongue. The tongue has to do a lot more than just stick their tongue, stick the tongue out. Yeah. Gosh, I have so many questions. I think what you're doing... <laughs> You're sitting at an intersection that's so important. I mean, you could talk about xerostomia, the chicken or the egg. I mean, yep. people breathing through their mouth. Is it so, this is just so important for overall health oh long my gosh, term. Yeah, yeah so I mean, just when you think about nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, I mean, when you're mouth breathing, you're in sympathetic overdrive. You're, right. you, you're, and we know sympathetic is uh, fight or flight. Parasympathetic is our rest and digest. How do you think you'll feel when you're in sympathetic overdrive all the time? That's why we see a lot of these patients that are mouth breathers have a lot of added stress, anxiety, sometimes depression. There's a lot that goes into it outside of just, of course, what's going on in this mouth area. I mean, it can truly impact your entire body, your digestion. Um, that's another big one. That's, right. you know, digestion starts in your mouth. So if you have dysfunction all the way up here, it makes sense how it's going to, you know, of course, impact your digestion. Also, your overall body posture. Um, I have some really cool, great before and after pictures of our tongue tie patients before and after release. Patients that have asymmetry in their shoulders, that those rolled shoulders, forward head posture. There's a piece of fascia that connects from your the tip of your tongue all the way down to your toes. So if you're presenting with this restriction all the way up in that chain, it again makes sense how it's going to present itself itself in different ways throughout your body. Wow. Now we don't have to go down this path, but I'm just going <laughs> to, it seems like palates are changing. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Like it's anyone's guess. I don't even, you, you go down that path and everyone's like, but I think we could all agree palates are changing more mm -hmm. than ever. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And, you know, uh, we were saying, talking about this before, so many of our patients come in that say, my tongue is just too big. And like, that's not, you have to look at it the other way. Macroglossia does exist, but it typically exists more in like patients with Down syndrome. Your tongue being too big, is it really that? Or is it that your mouth is too small? Your palate is too narrow. Your palate is vaulted. So it's not that your tongue is big. 
It's that your mouth is too small. So again, if your tongue, okay, from birth, we are born obligate nasal breathers. Our tongue should be resting up in the roof of the mouth. From the pressures of the tongue laterally and anteriorly, it will help to develop that nice U-shaped dental arch that we want. When that tongue isn't resting up there from a tongue tie or some kind of nasal obstruction and that tongue or thumb suckers, pacifiers, whatever reason that that tongue learns to sit in the floor of the mouth, the upper jaw now has nothing to support its growth. And typically that's where we see things cave in. And I think like, you know, epigenetically, there's a lot going on here. And, you know, Dr. Um, Kevin Boy, Dr. Mariana Evans, they're doing a lot of studying at an anthropology museum, looking at jaws dating back to, you know, essentially before Westernization, before we now have all the processed foods and, you know, kids don't have to chew these days and we have to chew. We have to use those muscles and develop those muscles to support big jaw structures. Wow. This is so great. I'm going to have you back. We're going to cover other subjects. There's no <laughs> question. What, but, uh, you know, uh, I want to leave space for you to be able to talk about your programs and things, but I also want to make sure that we've covered the topic. What else would you add about like the importance of oral rest posture and nasal breathing that we haven't covered already? Um, I mean, again, aside from proper craniofacial development, respiratory complex development. You want to think about if you actually, I have my little friend right here that I always show my patients. I always, even my five-year-olds, I'm like, can you tell me, I'm going to tell you that this is our jawbone, right? This is our upper jawbone. Can you tell me what color it is? They'll say red. Okay. Well, what else is making, is made up by this red bone? And they'll tell me their nose. Yeah. Yes. The roof of your mouth is also the floor of your nose and the lateral chambers of your nasal cavity. So if we do not have that correct oral rest posture, this growth and development is going to be impacted. And that is where we're going to mouth breathe. That is where things are going to grow wrong. And typically, again, then we can talk about all the other hosts. It's, it's just like a, a domino effect. I mean, it really can impact overall health so dramatically. You know, I just had a patient um, finish her myofunctional therapy program. She's Gosh, I don't know how old she is. I want to say she's somewhere in her 40s. I don't know where in the 40s. Can't think off the top of my head. And she came to us because she wasn't sleeping for more than like four hours at a time. Um, she was mouth breathing. She was getting winded. Um, and we finished her myo program. And I actually just posted her before and after pictures on my Instagram page today. Her postural changes were dramatic. Her facial profile changes, dramatic. And she just did myofunctional therapy. She does have a tongue tie that needs to be addressed, but she's not ready to address that. Um, and the biggest, coolest thing was she said that when she goes for her daily walks, she does not get winded anymore. She doesn't have to take a break. We did a lot of breathing reeducation with her, taught her how to breathe correctly. It's a big thing. People, you can tell somebody to be a nasal breather, but if those muscles aren't strong enough to support how we're actually supposed to nasal breathe, it's going to be very hard for them. Yeah. This is game changing. I love it. Heck, I need to learn how to breathe a little bit better. I mean, <laughs> as you get older, you know, it's like sleep, sleep is everything and managing everything. stress and even breathing during the day is so mm -hmm. important. So, mm -hmm. um, um, I want you to talk about your programs, but any last thoughts that you have on, you know, um, oral rest posture? Um, I think that everybody should check in with themselves, you know, uh, think about where your tongue is resting. Think about where your lips are, how you're breathing through your nose, start doing that broom screener in the app. Um, I also think, you know, I'm a big proponent. I know we're going to talk about our course. I don't think that every dental hygienist has to become a myofunctional therapist. Not every dental hygienist wants to, and that is totally fine. However, I do think that every dental hygienist should at least have the knowledge on how to properly screen for airway disorders and myofunctional disorders, because the difference that you can make in your patient's life is astronomical. Yeah. Talk about your course. So if I'm, if I'm listening, I want to take your course. Where do I find it? Yes. So airway health solutions, um, you will go to the myo course page. We have a bunch of courses on there. If you're new, you would start with our introductory course, which is an eight week um, online course. We meet, uh, let's see, a, a lecture is released every Wednesday. Monday nights, we meet live for a Q&A, which is a lot of fun. And it just takes the learning, learning experience to, to a whole new level. There's some pre-learns involved in that. 
And by the end of that course, you are ready to begin practicing myofunctional therapy. We talk about business development, like the whole jam. You will be ready. You will be confident to start seeing patients at the end of that eight weeks. Yeah. And don't worry if you're driving while you're listening to this podcast and you're not taking notes, we're taking notes for you. You can flip up to the show notes and there'll be a link right to Brittany's course that you mentioned, uh, Brittany. And I'm just going to encourage you as a listener, just click it. It'll go right there. Awesome. And uh, you and your team can take that. I, I want you to talk about your podcast. What is it? Like, yeah. this is so cool. Yeah. So it's called I Spy With My My OI. Um, We started it in 2020. It was literally right before the shutdown. I want to say it was January or February. Um, And I've had the pleasure of just being able to interview, you know, trailblazers in the field of airway, dental sleep medicine. Um, There's general dentists, orthodontists, pediatric dentists, physical therapists, TMJ specialists, occupational therapists, speech therapists. I mean, name the profession. They're on there because the one thing that is so important that you have to remember is collab collaboration is everything. It is not a one-stop shop. And that is something that we take the time to explain to our patients because it can be frustrating. You know, they get a referral to us to fix a tongue thrust. And now we're telling them that they need to have a sleep study. They need to see an ENT and that their palate is too small and we need to have some expansion it can be really overwhelming, but collaboration, you need to know who you need to have on your team for whatever age or type of patient that you're working with. And that is something that we would again, review on our myofunctional therapy course. Yeah. You guys got to check out both. And then you also have a Facebook group and a YouTube page. Tell us about it. Yes. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. Um, Instagram is probably where we're a little more lively. I think all our posts from Instagram get transferred to our Facebook page, but you can totally reach out to us there. Our YouTube page, we have a lot of our podcasts on there. A lot of the times when the guest wants to showcase something, whether it's a PowerPoint or a model or what have you, we put that on there. There's some other little tips and myo tricks, exercises, breathing techniques, things like that. Um, but yeah, follow us. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, let us know. If you are listening and you want to have an evaluation, let us know. Again, we do work virtually. Or if you have patients that you know you think might benefit from myofunctional therapy, I'd be more than happy to help kind of connect you with maybe somebody a little bit closer to you as well. Yeah, this is so awesome. Brittany, thank you so much for being Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. Oh my gosh. This is my pleasure. So I think what you're doing is amazing. So make sure you guys check it out. So Brittany, stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else, but thank you guys for listening to the best practices show podcast. Hey, if you enjoyed today, do us a favor, just hit the share button, share this with your friends. If you, we're going to have Brittany back. I always love the question. You guys send me all these requests and these questions, things that you want to hear us talk about, send them to me. I'll ask the expert herself those questions and we'll get the answer straight from her. So until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day. Mm -hmm.